All right, so we'll sit for just 10 minutes. I'll do a little bit of a, a guided meditation. So thank you all so much for um, showing up this evening. So first, let's connect with the goodness of our intention, our intention of coming together to investigate how we might live more skillfully, coming together to support each other. And really take to heart that everything is welcome in this room. We can bring every part of ourselves into our practice. We're developing an open and equanimous heart. A heart that recognizes the impermanent nature of all things and is equally tender toward all things. And we're developing a heart that can open to the specific pain of this moment. Opening to 100,000 deaths in our country from the coronavirus. Opening to the death of George Floyd. And part of our practice is to recognize that all of these events are the result of causes and conditions and that we're not separate. So let's just be open to that as best we can And just support each other in silence. Letting the caring heart mind care.
and we can connect with our deep and wholesome aspiration for all beings to be safe and protected. For all beings to be free from inner and outer harm. And may wisdom and compassion protect us all. Thank you again for coming here. And I just realized that I have not disconnected my landline. So if you give me a moment to do that. So this evening, we're going to investigate um, the third parami, which is renunciation. And um, I think this is a parami that I have just worked with a lot. And it's often renunciation with um, respect to speech in, in my part. But it's um, in renunciation, we are reinforcing the habit of restraint. We're giving something up voluntarily to reduce our own suffering and the suffering of others. And um, I was raised uh, as a, a Roman Catholic. And so renunciation was a part of being a good Catholic girl. And I remember that, you know, in, um, in Lent, we had what were called mite, M-I-T-E boxes for the widow's mite. And we were supposed to put coins in it. And um, you would give something up for, for Lent. Um, although I do remember when I was in about eighth grade and the priest came over to talk to us about Lent. And they said that they were giving up cigars and golf I, uh, I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, but um, it was the idea of, of this sort of a voluntary sacrifice. And actually, when I was in college during the Vietnam War, I became a vegetarian because I decided I would give up meat eating as a way of reminding myself about the killing that was going on in Vietnam. Um, I also was very much under the influence of Gandhi at the time reading that, and um, and it just made a lot of a lot of sense to me. And um, I think there's something about growing up Catholic that certain sorts of penitential practices come come pretty um, naturally. Um, but as I was preparing for this and thinking a lot about renunciation, I was reading. Um, some comments by Joseph Goldstein, and he has a very different uh, way of 
reframing the practice of renunciation. And he talks about it as non-addiction to desire. And that we could really frame our exploration of renunciation as looking at our habit patterns um, and, and seeing how we are, we behave in certain sorts of addictive um, ways. Uh, so it's, it's watching the wanting mind is really the, the key to, um, to renunciation, that we have this intent that we're going to watch what the mind wants and then think about whether it's wholesome or not wholesome or what's being reinforced. But it's to catch the one, the first step is kind of catching the, the wanting mind. Um, and it's, uh, you know, one of the things I think that, that is easiest to become aware of are our habits of distraction. Um, when we're um, uncomfortable, um, when we're bored, when something comes up that, that's painful, we often have this habit of distraction. Sometimes distraction is really skillful. Um, you know, sometimes when, um, you know, for example, someone is in physical pain, sometimes the best thing for that person to do may be to see if that person can get really engrossed in um, some DVD or something. There, there are lots of times where, where distraction can be a really skillful means when it's intentional. Uh, but if we have a habit of distracting ourselves whenever things are uncomfortable, that's something to uh, to really look at. Um, and we also have um, habits of separation, habits of um, pulling away. Uh, this may also be part of that, that distraction. When something is difficult, um, an interaction, we pull ourselves away, we, we do something else. And again, it's not, um, we shouldn't assume that that's unskillful, but the, the challenge is to really bring our mindful attention to what's going on in that sort of, of habit pattern. Um, during this time of uh, sort of enforced separation, there's a lot of what I think of as um, cocooning with the pleasant. And some of that is, is probably really skillful. But if that's all we're doing and we just have this desire not to feel any pain, the desire not to uh, be aware of either our own suffering or the suffering of others, that's a place where we can start practicing um, renunciation. Um, there's also the idea, and I thought this was intriguing, um, when we're bored, we often look for something to want. When we're bored, you know, open the refrigerator, um, browse catalogs, um, turn on the TV and see what's on um, Netflix or Amazon Prime. It's again, looking at how the mind is, um, is working with with desire. Um, and, um, you know, so we have all these sorts of habits around automatically satisfying our desire. Um, we often see this um, around um, food. And um, we often um, see this around uh, material objects that we automatically satisfy our desire. Um, my husband, who 
watches the stock market said to me, he was just amazed. He said, okay, so here it is. He said, everybody's staying inside and Lululemon stock has just gone through the roof. He said, how is that possible? Everybody's staying inside. And I said, well, I can sort of imagine you're there with your little, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, yoga video. And you're thinking, well, I'm doing a lot of yoga. Wouldn't it be nice to get some really cute yoga clothes? I said, of course, people are going to, they're going to sit there and they're going to uh, have Amazon Prime deliver some uh, Lululemon cute yoga pants or a top. Uh, I said, that's, I said, that makes complete sense to me that when you're bored, you get on the internet and you go shopping. Um, so, <clears throat> so we do that um, a lot around uh, material, material objects. And one of the things particularly in this time of pandemic is really to um, think about how sometimes it might not be a bad thing to satisfy our desire, but that every time we're having someone deliver something to us, that that person um, is having a contact, that, that mail carrier, that, that delivery person is uh, essentially exposing himself or herself or themselves to, um, to, uh, to the virus. So it's just worth, worth thinking about as we're doing kind of our, our ordinary um, things that we might not be thinking about before, how we can during this time um, just become more, more mindful and maybe really um, investigate, investigate the wanting mind and how we, uh, how we satisfy it. Um, we also, um, often uh, we have desires around a lot of pleasant sense experience. And Joseph suggests that <clears throat> actually this is a lot of just manipulation of perceptions that we want, pleasant perceptions, that it's not it's not wrong to appreciate the beautiful, but when we sort of feel entitled to it, that we should always have beautiful experiences, we should always have lovely fragrances and sort of engineering our lives around the satisfaction of those uh, desires is something just to be really mindful about. So I think that that's a, uh, that's a useful one. The other place where I see in myself um, some habits that I could work on around renunciation um, is, for example, needing to be right. And this is um, in a discussion, um, you know, needing to have uh, to be recognized as being right, that my opinion is the superior opinion, um, that my take on things is the most perceptive taste. And just watching this sort of, um, the energy behind that, the desire, and really seeing that can be um, rather humbling to see that, that, that wanting to be right. And some of you know that you know, I was, uh, my training was as a professional philosopher, and so that was, you know, sort of uh, what what we did. You know, you won the argument. Um, you uh, needing needing to be right, needing to be acknowledged as smart. That's something that I really um, see in myself, and and find it. Um, an area where I practice, have tried to practice renunciation. In that same vein, needing to be perfectly understood. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of you may find that, that the, this also in your relationship with partners, significant others, friends, um, your children, uh, needing to be perfectly understood 
needing to be right um, is, is an area. Um, and these days, one of the um, areas that I work with is uh, needing to be acknowledged as a good white ally. That desire to be acknowledged as a good white, the desire to be seen as a good white ally. And it's, um, you know, being a good white ally is really important to me. But the part about being seen, am I, you know, am I making the right sort of post on, on Facebook? Am I doing something that people will know that I am the good white ally? And to just see how our attachments to certain kinds of identities, how much desire there is in that. And what would it be like if we could let that go? If we could be free of that, of that need? And it's, it's really the, the project of seeing the desire and seeing the clinging to it and then see if we can let go of the clinging. And for me, it is noticing it over and over and over again. It's also sometimes helpful in seeing these certain sorts of patterns where we're kind of acting out and satisfying our wants if we can um, notice the conditions around them that give rise to them. You know, like if it's, um, you know, if I'm really tired, do I just head for food right away? If I'm, uh, or more likely turning on, on the television, um, you know, to, to really get a chance to see what these habit patterns are and to work with very, very mindfully um, letting go um, of them. Uh, and given on sort of a, a larger scale, given the structural inequities um, and the inherent privilege of, of being white, um, what would it be useful to investigate what we could let go of, what we need to do to let go of our privilege, which is often our, our comfort. Um, I had an idea earlier this year that I, I'm still working on about, you know, so what if the paramis were, um, were part of our public policy? I mentioned this, like I thought that generosity, like I love that Hennepin County Library automatically renews my, my books and my CDs and my DVDs if nobody else wants them. I think, oh, that's such an, an act of civic generosity. They just automatically renew it. I thought as public policy, what would renunciation look like? And I think it would probably look like reparations, reparations for enslavement. Um, so the question is, um, what can we um, let go of? What can we do to um, to become more aware of how our desires are almost automatically catered to as white persons for those of us on this in this room? who are white, and what could we do to, um, to work with that privilege? What can we renounce? I mean, and I would love to hear your suggestions about that. Uh, I do have two um, suggestions for working with this for people who are interested in investigating this more. And one is, um, let's see, Ruth, um, Ruth King's book, Mindful of Race, which is just um, a remarkable book by a wonderful, wonderful Dharma teacher. And I've done her 
trainings and they are really working with the individual, working with the community, working with the larger society, and that is such a great resource. And the other one is a book called My Grandmother's Hands, and it's, it's racialized trauma and the pathways to mending our hearts and bodies. And it's by Resma Menachem, And um, he talks about um, the police body in here, like literally what happens to the police body. This is another uh, wonderful text. And I think by looking at these, we're letting go of our, you know, reading only those things that make us feel comfortable and good, reading stuff that's really hard. But I would really encourage us to, to do this because renunciation reinforces the wholesomeness of the act of, of letting go, that we're not acting out of aversion when we are, um, when we are practicing renunciation. I mean, that's the idea. It's not that we're acting out of aversion, but we're acting out of that wholesome aspiration to live in a way that doesn't cause ourselves suffering and doesn't cause others suffering. And suffering in that, in that really deep and profound sense, it may make us uncomfortable. It may make us acutely uncomfortable, but ultimately, it's really for a kind of, of freedom, a kind of liberation from suffering. So I would love to hear your responses to this, your comments, your, your thoughts about working with this, questions, ideas. People have had some very creative ideas about how to, how to work with um, renunciation or anything else that you'd like to say about what we've been uh, chatting about. So please just feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Okay. Actually, I'm asking more of a broader question. Um, when I think about renunciation, it's like, how do you differentiate between, you know, habit needs maybe and other basic human needs? In other words, I think about, you know, like right now during this whole um, stay at home time, I mean, I'm finding, for example, I'm missing hugging people, touching mm -hmm. people. And, you know, so is that a basic human need or is that, you know, in my mind, I'm going, you know, oh, maybe I need to just give up those thoughts about, you know, being with people, but it's okay that I'm alone. And I know that, but it's really hard to balance that of, you know, I'm a human being. I want to be touched, you know? I, don't well, know I, think, how I mean, I, I do think that it's really important to um, acknowledge that we have some very, very um, basic and, and wholesome needs, like the, the need to connect um, would be very wholesome. What's interesting about this as, as a practice, and the Buddha talked about this, you know, the Buddha said that uh, when he was talking about his son Rahula, about doing something, he said, so Rahula, before you do it, think about it. Is this to my benefit and the benefit of others? Will it hurt me or hurt others? While you're doing it, is this hurting me? Is this hurting others? When you're done with it, is this hurting me or others? And if you make a mistake, if you, you thought that you were not gonna be harming yourself or others and you are, then talk with the wise. And I think that a lot of this practice, and, and this is what I love about, um, Buddhist practice. It's so pragmatic. It's so empirical. It's now try this. See what happens. What happens to your to your mind? You know, it may be the most skillful thing I can do at 10 o'clock at night is to watch parks and recreation. That might be so much more skillful than just kind of, of you know going to bed and just going over and over and over the grief of the day or not. I mean, it, it really is, the, the challenge in this is to really see for ourselves 
and to practice and to try different sorts of, of strategies. And to just also, I think it's really important to remember our good intentions. Although, especially around um, issues about race, intentions are really important, but we can never say that that um, means that we can ignore the impact. So we can't take refuge in our good intentions around race when we've done something that someone said that was really insensitive, that was really harmful, saying, well, I had good intentions, that's no defense. I mean, that's where the Buddha would come back and say, what didn't you know when you made that remark or you did that thing that you didn't think was going to uh, be harmful to someone else? So, you know, I, I really think intention is the key, but it's always informed intention that we're really bringing our mindfulness to this practice, that we're really bringing our mindfulness to our own habits, to our own aspirations, um, and, and really investigating that. And I think that's the, what, what I just love about this practice is it's very pragmatic and very empirical. To follow up on your, first of all, I, I really like the phrase, the wanting mind. And um, I think, for instance, um, in my situation, the wanting mind of wanting to see my beloved, who's a thousand miles away, and wanting to see my mother in a nursing home, whom I did see today for the first time in 75 days, uh, outside, and um, that there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that is, you know, it's a desire to be with the people that you love. Um, if I needed to be seen in a particular way in wanting those things, um, or if you, what you were describing as wanting to be seen as a good white person, then what, how I understand that is that the focus is on the wanting of how the self is, is presented and, and perceived. And then the focus is only on the self. And it's really not on the activity of anti-racism, or it's really, for me, not on the activity of really connecting with um, you know, my mother or my beloved or, or anybody else. It's mm -hmm. more about the perception. And when you drop that need for the self perception to be in a certain way publicly, it opens up all this room. Then if somebody says that remark was really insensitive, well, you don't have the defense of having to preserve this or present the self in a certain way. You don't have that defense. You can actually possibly hear it and make mm -hmm. it. And it opens up um, a lot more curiosity as well. No, oh, that's beautifully said. Thank you. That really adds to this. Thank to, you. you know, kind of elucidate maybe a little further in my mind about how I work with that coming up is, you know, first of all, it's like, is this a need or is this a want? You know, I mean, this internally, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, and, and I do have a predilection for having very strong wants, um, postulate, postulate self-postulated as, this is something I need, as if, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, I'm not gonna make it in the world, I'm not gonna survive unless I get this get this, you know, um, so it just kind of watch with a sense of compassion that um, I am a needy wanting person because it's kind of came with the human license, all right, but I need to be really careful if I'm not going to bring further suffering to myself or to others about interrogating them regardless of which way they come up. You know, and um, yeah, just along the guidelines of what you already said, it's like um, to be connected to other people um, and to be touched is, we could certainly say it's a human need. I mean, babies, 
you know, don't do well when they're not touched. This was, you know, a huge discovery about um, uh, children in orphanages and so forth, that they, you know, failed to thrive. Now we're in a situation where if I push that out into the world, I can endanger other, my own and other people's health. So I can hold that as something that, yeah, is dear to me and it, but it's not appropriate right now in most of the contexts that I have going to embrace any of my dear friends and relatives. Um, and can I, can I live with that? And the answer is yes, because I don't, my deepest wish is not to bring harm. Thanks. Thank I need you. To do virtual hugs, Steve. <laughs> well, they, I mean, one thing is very, I'm glad you brought up compassion. As you know, the, the two wings of the Dharma are wisdom and compassion, and they're always acting together. And a really important part of compassion is self compassion. And this may sound very um, corny, but one of the things that when Kristen Neff teaches self compassion, one of the things that she encourages people to do is to stroke themselves, is to really caress themselves, is to bring that, um, bring that sense of touch and caring to yourself. And uh, I know that, that for people like Dan Harris and other um, more rugged meditators, that sounds um, you know, extremely, that's too touchy-feely. But she makes the very interesting point that, um, you know, it, it really, that bringing that sense of touch. So often when I do metta practice or compassion practice, I bring my hand to my heart. You know, it, it's, it's a way of just letting the whole body remember this. So the idea of, of compassion as we do these renunciation practices, you know, especially if it's a really kind of ingrained habit and we've had all these years, all this kind of karmic momentum of getting this, this habit um, in place of satisfying this, this desire. And so having a lot of compassion for um, the challenge to let go of that and really trying to remember that what we're looking for is, um, is the, the sense of release that we have when we're no longer congealed around um, that habit. It, one of the wonderful things that um, Biko Nalio talks about in, in compassion that was really important to her, he said the thing about compassion is that we, we uh, hold another's suffering and we have the, the deep desire for that person to be released from suffering that that's part of it, that we wish for the liberation from that person's suffering. And that wish is kind of a joyful thing. So I think that it's really important as we do all of these practices to, uh, to really hold them with a sense of compassion for others and a sense of compassion for ourselves. Other thoughts? Uh, I'd like to go back and speak to uh, your initial question about and, and framing it within the um, racial paradigm. Um, one of the re, re, one of the ways I've been working with renunciation as the good white person, because I I carry that also, is um, in those moments in interaction or conversation with a person of color when I express myself in some way that just in the moment after it's said or done, there's unexamined white privilege in the room. I just, you know, I just know it. I've stumbled over it. I feel it. I, I like, oh, I wasn't thinking of the impact. I was speaking from my own position of ease. And I wasn't, uh, what's the word I use? Like, I wasn't aware of my whiteness in the moment. I forget my whiteness, right? Which is a form of privilege. And in uh, all of the work I've done around uh, raising my consciousness about white privilege and racism, 
it's also woken up in me and stirred up in me issues around patriarchy as a as a woman mm -hmm. and some of the ways that you know those those parallel dynamics occur so when this happens to me as a white person when i'm not looking at my privilege and something comes out of my mouth i used to get defensive oh i'm sorry i didn't mean or you know now sometimes an apology is appropriate and, and necessary for the other person but mostly it's to protect my own image and it hasn't gone over well and i think when when a um a man uh exhibits unexamined male privilege and it has an impact on me the very worst thing the thing i don't want to hear is i'm not sexist i'm doing all this work with feminism i'm really an ally i you know you took that the wrong way whatever mm -hmm. so i've learned not to do that as a white person with a person of color and sometimes i just shut up and i let it hang in the room it's been very uncomfortable for me to just let it be and that person may think whatever they're thinking in that moment but that's for them to, it's like it's like it's not my business to get in there and change what that experience was for them i'm just kind of like not protect my my image or something mm -hmm. and, and it's you know what's happened like there's been oh, of course not now but there are a number of opportunities to practice that and it's that's been making me by shutting up it's making me more aware of the number of times when i do express that privilege without knowing it you know unintentionally um, and i just want to add one more thing that i've been thinking of since the pandemic and it's about food distribution and this goes to social inequality what am i willing to do and it really struck me that the food banks depend on the scraps of uh, grocery stores and uh, restaurants at the end of the day what's nearly spoiled what they're not going to use what hasn't sold the things that have been picked over by other people have chosen you know the, the best and it hit me that the school that we donate this is for the people the most vulnerable in our community people that are ill that are poor that you know are suffering from all kinds of ills and we feed them the, the worst of the food that we have so i had this vision wouldn't it be great if we opened the grocery stores in the morning and somebody went in and took the best off the top and sent that to the food banks where the where the fragile in our community and those of us who are a little better off we, we would eat the rest and it wouldn't be the dregs but we'd have to be a little more careful you know about how how we did things and i was just thinking how, how does it get to be that the most needy get the worst get the at the bottom of the barrel. Um, so that's a question I've been practicing. What am I willing to, am I willing to not get the best orange, you know, at Whole Foods? So somebody, so somebody who's, and I'm telling you, I'm thinking completely different about that. When I go back in a store, if I ever get there, it's just a real different frame. Thanks for bringing that up. That's really worth thinking about. Thank you so much. Thank you. I had not thought about that was thinking about uh, several things. Um, one of them being uh, working on, I pr am personally working on renunciation with uh, my own personal papancha, all the chatter, mm -hmm. chatter mm -hmm. going on all the time. It's, and um, well, I've been working on it for a long time, but uh, now that we're so-called sequestered, uh, good old Papancha or Mara likes to show up at two or three in the morning. And what I have lately, I've been working on, okay, I'll, I'll do Joseph Goldstein style. You know, he has, he has several different steps that he goes mm -hmm. through, but then ultimately when none of them work, then he'll just say, just shut up, go yeah. away, shut up. And, um, so I've come, I, I, I have gone to that step, but then what I have found that is really helpful is uh, I'll go, okay, identify what, what is, what fear got triggered in me? Because a lot of times it is fear, you know, when Bapancha, it's like uh, all these the voices and going on and on and over and over. Um, if I can zone in on, on that 
well, then that person or that situation, I work on just sending meta. And that really, because I, I don't know whether it was Sharon Salzberg or whatever, said that when you're coming from that place of meta, you're coming from anatta, not self. Mm -hmm. and not, not self doesn't exist when you're, when you're genuinely practicing metta. And it's like, I, I find that real helpful at, uh, some, or, or sometimes when I'm trying to, when I'm getting ready to fall asleep and uh, the incessant chatter comes up and Mara likes to peek its head out and poke at me, I'll go, oh, okay. Let me just let me just practice some meta here. So um, I, I guess that's one of the things I've been working on in terms of re renunciation, looking at the papancha, and how to how to work with that. Thanks. I heard um, Dan Harris once describe papancha as a single data point colonizing the whole mind. <laughs> and uh, but but you know in some ways. Um, Metta is kind of the universal solvent. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, it's a concentration practice. So it really kind of collects the mind and it is so um, wholesome. And uh, so being able to, to have a metta or metta karuna, metta compassion, like compassion mm -hmm. for the proliferating mind compassion for the mind I mean, if you can just say oh my my poor mind it's just you know it's, it's kind of on the hamster wheel there's mm -hmm. all, and, and just um you know holding it with that kind of, of tenderness and wishing it well and then always you know we remember impermanence it will not be this mm -hmm. way always things are always changing so impermanence really, although it often sounds like it's um, you know, sort of frightening that the, the, the ground is constantly shaking, the ground is constantly shaking. Things are impermanent. And when we, we really get that in the deepest kind of way, it really clarifies the importance of our uh, our thoughts, our speech, our action, our love. When we really get impermanence, that really frees us in, in a way to, um, to really live the Dharma. I, I think that is, and I, I really appreciate the very um, candid and generous and insightful comments that everyone um, offered tonight. And I really appreciate your being here. And I promised that we would always end by seven. Um, so let's just take a minute and um, sit together for a moment. really appreciating how good it is to be together. How we give support to and get support from each other. And may wisdom and compassion protect us always. And may our lives be of benefit to all beings. <laughs>